Welcome, Rupert Miles. Thank you very much for joining me on Insights this morning. Um, as a little bit of a background, um, Rupert is um, the head of Sandler Training Essex, um, and Sandler is a worldwide training organization um, operating in more than 40 countries out of 300 offices. Um, and Rupert bought the Sandler franchise for Essex in 2018. Um, the reason why I've invited um, Rupert to talk to us is because he's had, in my opinion, a very varied and distin distinguished career um, in all sorts of areas of um, publishing and sales, having worked for the BBC, he's worked for ITV, um, he's worked at The Guardian. Um, you've had like loads of experience. So um, if we could start at the beginning, um, when, well, obviously your career started at the BBC, so how did that happen? Actually, my career started way before then, Anna. Um, oh, really? I think the notes I gave you were just random names. Uh, yeah, uh, no, I, I, uh, my story is very straightforward. I got thrown out of university. I didn't have a job and I went to sell advertising space nine till five with an hour for lunch, cold calling off a script for four months. And I used that to persuade uh, a local newspaper that it was a good idea they employ me. And, and that launched, well, what you might call a career, although it's slightly random and slightly haphazard, uh, in media. Local newspapers to national press, uh, national press um, uh, to uh, magazine publishing, magazine publishing into the world of online, and then more generally into, into general management. So various, various brands have been quite, a, quite haphazard, really. It's a bit of a it's a bit of a journey, really. I think um, for for a lot of us that are um, entrepreneurial, we have what seems like a very haphazard sort of like um, course or development of our careers, where we're doing one thing sort of like for a few years, and then that progresses to something else, and then we find that sort of like we have a passion for something else, so that leads us into a completely different um, tangent. So from an entrepreneurial perspective, I'd have thought that this is actually part of the course that we get led on these magical mystery tours through life. Yeah, it, is, it does appear quite random. I mean, of course, people post-rationalise these things uh, and they look at this kind of path and they see it much, much more direct than it actually was at the time. But yeah, no, the, uh, the mindset is just keeping open to opportunities, learning lots, connecting with loads of people, being known, but being curious. And when you are, it's amazing how much uh, opportunity opens itself up for you. Uh, absolutely. I think sort of like curiosity and um, the concept of lifelong learning, of, of, of having a curiosity where different things will pique your interest. So then you kind of like dive in, um, I think is very much part of what um, keeps us young, keeps us vibrant and keeps the journey interesting. Very much so. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, in your little notes to me, you've also said that um, you, you've actually helped um, different businesses, of both large and small, sort of like launch into the online arena. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yeah. that? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, um, when the World Wide Web uh, was in its infancy. So we're talking somewhere around 1993, uh, 94 in the UK. It's more developed in the US at the time, as you'll recall. Um, I came across uh, a magazine. I was a magazine publisher at the time. I was publishing uh, Radio Times, which is owned by BBC. And uh, it's the biggest title, still is actually the most profitable title in the UK. Uh, so in one sense, I was at the top of a little kind of publishing uh, tree in terms of my career. But I came across a magazine called Wired uh, that's still, I think, published by Condé Nast. Yeah. But it called itself the magazine for the, uh, the digerati, as they call themselves. And it was really weird. And, and the, first, the first time I looked at this magazine, I thought this, this 
this publication defies all the expectations of how you should forget the content, but just how you should lay out and display content. So it mixed uh, typography, it mixed color schemes. A, a lot of the words were barely legible because of the way they'd done it. They'd obviously tried to kind of give an impact of something dramatic happening, but of course they were using a very traditional format, print on paper. But I picked this first issue up, uh, I don't know where I uh, discovered it, uh, but I started reading it, despite the fact it was quite difficult to read some of it. And then I suddenly, the uh, scales fell away from my eyes and within I'm a matter of hours or so, I was full on to what on earth this World Wide Web thing should be. So when the BBC kept, went looking for someone who could uh, launch uh, what became BBC Online, uh, it wasn't at the time, uh, we just had it as bbc.co.uk, uh, to launch bbc.co.uk, uh, they were looking for somebody who knew something about the World Wide Web. Well, I'd spent probably about three or four months at Radio Times expense learning about it and uh, connecting with people in Silicon Alley in New York uh, and really getting under the skin of it. So when it came to uh, choosing somebody to lead it, so the kingdom of the blind, Anna, <laughs> the one-eyed man is king. And I was, I don't think I even had half an eye, but I was able at least against, I suspect anybody else who was interested, which I suspect there weren't that many people uh, to put myself forward. And everybody said, you're bonkers. You're absolutely bonkers. Why give up? Um, a perfectly good, uh, reasonably high status role in the world of publishing, which we know makes sense uh, and something you work so hard for to just go literally as one man and not even a laptop or a, or a computer to begin with. I just had a telephone. And the way I was getting onto the internet was I used my uh, PC to connect to a mobile phone it costs a fortune to get on and try and download at the rate of about one logo every half an hour, um, uh, what little there was on the web at the time. So it was real Keystone Cop stuff. Yeah. But I got the gig and, um, and it was amazing. Uh, the, the, um, the, the people who told me it was a mistake, I, I knew they, I absolutely knew they were wrong. Um, and most of them said, oh, it's just mail order by another name which I guess is one aspect of it. But what they didn't get was that if you could connect networks highly effectively, then that actually would lead to an awful lot of power around information. And although it sounds odd that Radio Times uh, should put me in the right frame for that, at Radio Times, we recorded uh, all of the program listings for the next week. We got it 10 days in advance uh, and so by the time we published, it was largely out of date because the schedules changed so much. Um, there were, at, th at that stage, even then in the mid 90s, there were 70 channels. We had room to display no more than about uh, half a dozen, well, maybe 20 in terms of listings. So we, we covered barely, barely a quarter of the available listings. Um, and we, we charged for it when every, this information was given away free. So you can imagine that, you know, that, that kind of concept of connecting information is what, what got me going because I thought, oh, my goodness, here we go. We've got the Sky television at that stage. We're building a set-top box with permissioned access through an electronic program guide to listings. I've got the Internet, which means as soon as people connect to data sources, probably the same data sources I'm using to publish this magazine, they're going to get it live up to the minute, exactly accurate, and do it like that. I said, I'm shot. I'm dead in the water. And so I did it out of self-interest to begin with, you know, self-preservation. And we, we took some decisions then, which actually means that Radio Times is still in rude good health from a publishing point of view, but actually it launched me into this other journey. And, and then everything I've done since, although it may have had a, an aspect of traditional analog um, activities uh, in the media world, it, it's, it inevitably has had a, a digital counterparts even if it hasn't been pure play digital so that's, that's how i got into it yeah no I, I remember those days um very well because um at the time in the mid 80s after i graduated um from uni with my degree in computer science i went to work for ibm and ibm got the contract along with um, british telecom to lay the backbone of what would become the internet and i got very very interested in um the actual coding of websites. 
I, I, I thought that this was going to completely and totally level the playing field, completely change um, the landscape for business. And uh, as a one man self, or well, one woman self-taught um, coding person, um, and in those days, you're quite right. I mean, sort of like, I remember um, I had a computer in my house. Um, IBM gave me a computer because I used to do a lot of um, research and development work, which meant that I'd have to speak to colleagues in um, Silicon Valley. And apart from the time zones, they gave me this modem, which connected to my telephone line. So it was kind of like you dial up through this modem to get to where you're going. And I remember sort of like, unfortunately, IBM was not paying my telephone bills, but there, there were times in, in those um, very, very early heady days when there was virtually nothing on the internet. And what was there was kind of like very flat and primitive. There was, there was no animation, there was, there was no broadcasting. And as you say, sort of like it would take half an hour for an image to load. Um, my telephone bill was like through the roof. I mean, I think probably two thirds of my salary went on my telephone bill because I was kind of like constantly online, sort of like talking to these people in America and sort of like figuring out, well, where are we going from here? And I mean, even in those very early days, it was everybody was forward thinking and they were thinking about how are we going to bring media to the masses because the whole point of the internet was supposed was, uh, you know, the foundation thought was that it was supposed to be the information superhighway. And in some ways it is, but in, in some ways, I think over the last 30 or so years, things have been slightly skewed, but um, that's possibly another conversation. But I, I do remember those very, very, very um, early days. And it was exciting. When you say, did you, sorry, Anna, I missed that. Did you say skewed? Yes, I, I think that the way what, that... Um, what do you mean by that? I, I think that some of the ways that information gets shared now, there's kind of like, obviously, um, over the last two years, there's been lots on in the media, on the media, um, on, the, on the internet to do with um, fake news, disinformation, the use of the internet to kind of like disseminate um, propaganda and present it as truth when it's not really true at all. It's, it's just um, an opinion led perspective and pe different people sort of like jumping on board with it. And um, there's actually a really interesting book that I'm reading at the moment by um, Douglas Murray, which is to do with, um, with how sort of like the, the internet and what started out as so good has been slightly skewed with kind of like different things going on um, or possibly possibly nefarious nefarious I should say um, and it, he talks a lot about cancel culture identity politics and um, th these different sort of like social groups that have sort of like and how they're using the media sort of like for propaganda purposes rather than for um, real genuine news but again for us as entrepreneurs, that we still continue to use the internet to be truthful in our service offerings. So, you know, that that's kind of like the duality of, of what the internet has to offer, like you, or, or maybe even more, because you've got like the real news, the fake news and propaganda, and then us business people in the great mix of things kind of like going, you know, here we are still trying to have a voice, still trying to compete with, um, the giants of business and industry. Yes. No. Wow, there's a lot there. And I, I do, do you mind if I just just make one or two comments? Or, yeah, or absolutely. Please do. It's okay. a conversation. Yeah, it's, it's just that I, I think I came at the internet from a slightly different perspective from many people, mm -hmm. um, because I was primarily interested uh, in content creation, the internet and, and building audiences right from the get-go and obviously with a brand like the BBC I had a, a, a massive head start I mean uh, there was no door uh, that remained closed to me so I had an enormously privileged uh, access but uh, from my point of view it, it remains true to this day you've mentioned a number of things fake news uh, propaganda the, the nefarious kind of uses of the internet whether it's the open or the dark web 
whatever it happens to be. But for me, this doesn't feel like anything other than everything that's gone before. I, I don't lay at the foot of the internet uh, these woes, and I, I, I don't think you probably do at all. Propaganda was not invented for no. the internet. No, um, not at you know, all. we think about, uh, you know, and, and that's been perpetuated down the ages. If we think about other technologies, you know, why did VHS beat uh, Betamax? Was it Betamax? Only Betamax was the alternative. Why? It was an inferior platform. Well, it was the one the pornographers used. <laughs> I mean, you know, and suddenly, oh, the internet's awful. It's all this awful stuff going on. This awful stuff has been going on since, I don't know, the primordial soup threw out a kind of a form that was able to breathe and be sentient and communicate. You know, we are, um, uh, despite the better angels of our nature, we have a propensity to behave in ways that aren't necessarily <laughs> kind of um, stand up to scrutiny. Oh. I think the beauty of the internet, the beauty of the internet, um, is that uh, the thing that worries me, uh, and I'll come on to that in a second, but the beauty of the internet is uh, that what, what I saw in it straight off, that kind of click, was this was a way to connect people in a, in a way beyond anything that had hitherto been done. Oh. And if you, you think about the development of uh, media, if you think about the original mass market medium was Caxton's printing press, you know? Yeah. It's that kind of great invention but in, and it took centuries, partly because of the restriction of uh, religious bodies, to get reading and printing and, and distribution uh, to the masses, but it got there. And then we have the uh, things like radio, television, and, and increasing stuff, the internet. If you look at the rates of adoption, the internet, it was vertical. All the others took time to get there, to get the penetration, to get the access and everything. The internet was just steep. When I first came across it, there was, I don't know how many people in the UK, almost no one online, but it was just the, the rate of access was incredible. I would give presentations lasting 45 minutes and I'd say during this time, another 4,000 people have subscribed to the internet. It was just, it was explosive stuff. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. But it brought out, sorry, Anna, sorry. I, I said like, yeah, at the time it, it really was, it, it was, it was more than exponential, so like it, it was a really, really crazy, heady time, and it was it was very exciting, you know. I mean, I, I found that time to be really, really exciting because I was talking to people on the other side of the world that unless I actually got on a plane, um, well, I wouldn't have actually even have met them, so there would have been no point of me getting on a plane, you know. And, and for me, that's that's the bit of it that I found really exciting that I really like that, you know, I could go to different forums in those days and sort of like type in whatever my interests might have been, whether it was art or politics or economics or business or whatever. And I'd find a whole pile of like like minded, interested people who would want to know what was happening in the UK. And I'd want to know what was happening somewhere in Europe or somewhere in America or somewhere in Australia. And, that connectivity was absolutely brilliant, and that still exists. Uh, that's the heart of it. But the trouble is you can connect about interesting things and good things, and then you connect about bad things. I think the real challenge for the internet is how on earth do you regulate it when it effectively demolishes the concepts of borders and boundaries? And there's a whole load of stuff going on in Europe at the moment, uh, which seems to be the kind of policeman of the internet. The Americans don't seem to have a scooby uh, about what to do, and their whole economy is now driven by tech giants who are based on it. So it is largely out of control and extremely worrying, uh, both from an individual level and also from a collective point of view. But you know, guess what? There's no surprise to any of this. No. Uh, and would that I, you know, if God help the regulators, God help the governments. I mean, anybody who wants to get stuck into that, good luck to you. In the meantime, we as business people have a massive opportunity. I mean, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is effectively free. It's free advertising. And yet less than, I think it's less than 4% of uh, the population of LinkedIn in this country are active posters. Yeah. That is like saying you can have access to the airwaves potentially to reach, with the potential to reach 100% of whatever niche target audience you've got. You can access them 24 hours a day, round the clock, communicating your messages with them, reaching, connecting, all that kind of good stuff. And we're not gonna charge you 
and seven sorry 96 percent of people with that offer on the table for their business decline it oh, i no, find it bizarre yes. and thank god they do because it gives more prominence to those people who are doing it yeah. uh, and the ones who are taking it seriously and doing consistent stuff i mean you couldn't have dreamt of this 20 or 30 years ago the money i would have had to spend to get the presence i've got online at the moment would have been way beyond my means so this there's a massive amount of good stuff out there. Oh, absolutely. But it's mixed. I mean, it, it, in the COVID climate as well, like uh, how many businesses had they stayed in the traditional model of pre-internet? How many of them would have failed had they not been? Mine, mine would have stopped overnight. Yeah. I rely on face-to-face -face communication and I can only do it now through Zoom clearly without Zoom, then that would have been it. No business. And there's lots that are in that exactly. uh, position. It, it, can I... Sorry, go on. I was going to say it's exactly the same for me. I mean, sort of like technology, in my view, although it does have its kind of like shadowy dark side that I that I am concerned about because I, I really do worry about the corruption of the internet, taking it away from the wonderful opportunities that it has to offer to all of us. I mean, there's um, being sort of like into lifelong learning. I mean, I, I look at all of the the university type courses that I have available to me to expand my my knowledge in, in, in different areas of interest, which, you know, I don't have time to go to university. I don't necessarily have the resources to go to university, but I do have time to dip in and out of different courses in the evening or on the weekend through the internet, you know, and I think that this is one of the magical, wonderful things about it that we can continue to educate ourselves and um, do a whole host of amazing things. I mean, I don't know that my business would have survived had it not been for the internet and applications like Zoom and Skype and um, definitely LinkedIn um, to kind of like keep the presence there. Yeah. Well, it's not, it's not just about survival of existing businesses. It's created a whole slew of new businesses and, uh, and will continue so to do it although the COVID-19 threat is, is uh, potentially existential for a loss of businesses, mm -hmm. it will spawn uh, all sorts of things we couldn't, couldn't hitherto have dreamt of, and the internet will be an enabler to that. Yeah. But I would just like to make one more point about LinkedIn, okay? Yeah. Um, and I have no ax to grind about LinkedIn, but if anyone listening to this um, broadcast, webcast, podcast, whatever we call it, uh, uh, is sitting there thinking, you know, maybe I ought to think about getting on LinkedIn. Uh, the best time to have done it would have been yesterday. Uh, and the second best time is to do it today. Because what's going to happen tomorrow is, uh, and I define tomorrow, but it's within a reasonably near time frame, is that LinkedIn will introduce in a much greater way than it currently does uh, the concept of effectively paying to get visibility. So they will drive the ad model, which they haven't hitherto done. Uh, but anyone who's, who's uh, tried to use Facebook would realize that the advertising dollar speaks loudest. Yes. And the same will happen to LinkedIn. So if you, if you um, are at all hesitant, don't, um, don't sit in two years time wishing you'd done it when you had the opportunity. Yeah. Now is the time. Um, and so I'm, I'm a great evangelist for getting great content out on LinkedIn. I'm not interested in TikTok videos. I'm not interested in cats. I'm not interested in funny stuff that seems to be beginning to permeate LinkedIn. But there is a lot of really, really good advisory material, which is free to consume, free to post. And I think it enhances our community to a great degree. I just really encourage anyone who's got that stuff to get it out there. And also in the, in the same way, get famous and who knows, maybe even connect with people that you can work with and uh, make, make a profit from, who knows? Yeah, yeah very no, good, absolutely. big opportunity. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm a big fan of LinkedIn. I think um, I was one of the um, early adopters. I've been on LinkedIn now for about 10 years. And I have to say that it's been a bit of a learning curve um, with regards to the use of LinkedIn and, and all that sort of stuff. But um, I'd have to say that probably over the last five years or so, I make a point of posting at least once a day, every day, um, okay. about something within my, my sphere of expertise. I keep, um, I keep all of the politics out of it. I keep all, all of the stuff that's kind of like personal to me stays off my LinkedIn. 
My LinkedIn is totally to do with my business and the professionalism of, of, of what it is that I'm doing and what I've got to offer. And I, I totally, um, I totally, totally agree with you. So like, ideally yesterday, last week would have been even better. Um, but if you're not on LinkedIn and you're not using it properly, you should really, as a business person, think about using it today. And that brings me to another thing, because um, I actually um, attended one of your courses um, last year when we were actually able to meet in person up in um, Chelmsford. And off the back of that course, yeah. um, you provided me with a really amazing resource from, um, I think it was a, a Sandler publication or maybe something that you'd created under the Sandler um, banner. And it was about um, souping up or revving up your, your LinkedIn profile so that your profile actually works for you rather than just being this kind of, um, I don't know, two-dimensional flat persona thing. It was, how can you actually enhance your LinkedIn profile? And um, I don't know, um, I, I think that that was an absolutely outstanding piece of work, which I do recommend to people. Um, if sure. you haven't sure. got Rupert's, um, what, what was it actually called? I mean, I'm, I've got it here somewhere um, beside me. Uh, we we uh, produce, um, uh, it's in electronic format, so it's very easy to dis distribute. Uh, LinkedIn, the Sandler way. Uh, which is quite short, but quite pithy, some basic kind of rules on LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, I think if you're a, you're a long-time LinkedIn user, it'll probably just confirm some of the basics you already understand. If you're looking at just, am I, uh, are there things that I could be doing that are fairly simple to do, it's a good way of uh, just refreshing you on that. So, yeah, and if anyone listening yeah. to this uh, would like a, a copy of it it is as uh, Anna says it's it's I distribute it freely I think it's quite helpful uh, and you've got I think on screen you should be able to see my contact details and I expect Anna when she posts this will probably put yeah. uh, contact yeah, details and the copy underneath so uh, by all means by all means do that yeah well, well I found it quite helpful in sort of like in tweaking my profile especially as like you my career has kind of like taken sort of like these very weird and wonderful tangents to get me to the point where I am now. It's almost like my whole life has come back round full circle on me um, with lots of detours into other areas um, in between time. And I, I found um, the content about LinkedIn that you had provided me with off the back of a course that I'd done with you, because everybody who's interested, um, Rupert also does courses, but we'll talk about those shortly. Um, I, I just found it really useful for um, tweaking my profile and, and making it more relevant to where my career is now because previously um, my LinkedIn had been very, very ha heavy on where I'd come from and not so much of it was focused on my present and my, my future. So I found it really, even though I was a bit of an old hand at LinkedIn, I found it really very useful for tweaking it and making my profile more relevant. So absolutely. I think I, I think there's a number of things here and more generally uh, when you talk about grit, which is that kind of mixture of passion and determination that helps people succeed. Uh, even when you have been doing something for many years, uh, the people with grit are the ones who keep revisiting their behaviors, keep revisiting the results and keep refining and learning. So you can never stop. I know you're a great advocate of life learn, long learning. Uh, but don't for one moment think, and I'm sure no one does, that successful people reach a plateau of success that they then comfortably cruise along. It's far from that. So they have to keep really interrogating and understanding what works and what doesn't and talking and engaging with people who may have other ideas, different ways of doing it in order to keep, uh, as it were, sharpening the axe, to make sure that they're able to kind of cut through the stuff as quickly as possible and then keep consistently doing it. And so, yep, uh, it was, it was, I'm glad, I mean, it talks to why I do what I do, which is trying to help people um, with what's, which, well, what I think in business is probably the toughest gig, uh, which is selling. And um, I don't think it's in any way recognized for the value because if we look around, you know, if you look around wherever you are at the moment, look at the objects, look at the the structures, look at the kind of the, the paint on the wall, the furniture, the fabrics or whatever, every single one 
of those objects involved at some stage, somebody sitting down and having a sales conversation. Our commerce just would not uh, do without it. And so often sales people don't get the support that they need. And when we go into business, it sometimes comes as a bit of a surprise that our great idea that we've been so passionate about for so years, we finally got it and we launch it. And then it's kind of, kind of doesn't really fly because we've got to get out there and, and sell it. So um, doing that uh, for, with people day in, day out is, is why I do what I do. Yeah. So um, that's, uh, that's my I mean, kind of raison d'etre as well. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, in, in my career, I've always found the selling aspect of it really, really challenging um, because sort of like when you talk about sales, so many people sort of like have this vision in their head of the used car salesman, sort of like being really, really, really yep. pushy and kind of, yep. yeah, just being kind of pushy and unpleasant. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, we, you know, definitely me, I have curiosities about different things, new technologies and how might that kind of like add to what I'm doing or, or what have you. And then you come across these salespeople that because you've shown an interest in something and you want more information, they're then suddenly on at you with the hard sell, which I found, which I find really quite offensive. Whereas I know that um, your technique of selling is nothing like that at all. And I've, um, again, having been on one of your courses, I found it extremely refreshing to kind of like, um, to understand sort of like um, the way that, that you do it, because it's kind of like selling without selling. It's kind of like if somebody's not interested, then actually sort of like, if I remember correctly, you sort of said that that's to be taken as, as a blessing in disguise, because this person has just saved you a whole pile of wasted time and you can move on to the next prospect who may be, genuinely more interested um so yeah um i think it's um i think this whole thing of selling because we're all doing it i mean even being here now i mean this is my new passion project and i see this as my way of paying it forward and creating opportunities for other people but i'm still selling something i'm selling i'm selling the ideas and i'm selling sort of um, I don't know, I'm create, I'd like to think that I'm creating opportunities for my network and not really selling as such, but it's opening doors. Uh, I see myself as, as a facilitator, as a door opener. But in that, I've still got to sell the concept of what it is that I'm trying to do and why I'm trying to do it. And that can be really challenging, you know. Um, but um, so, so that's... Um, do you want to add more things about sales? Because you are... The man. I'd, I'd watch out, ask me that, Anna, because uh, I'd still be going in about 10 hours time. Um, but yeah, d d uh, scrolling back to, to a little of what you were saying. So um, I think uh, there is definitely, and I think since we were children, mm. we had this, uh, this attitude to being sold to. Um, the phone rings and six-year-old Anna rushes because she's an enthusiastic young child rushes to pick up the phone first and at the other end of the phone there's someone asking for her mummy and she says um who's calling and uh that person says oh it's an opportunity for mummy we just happen to be in the area and we're doing uh assessments for double glazing could you tell her that and so uh, little Anna puts the phone down, runs off to mummy and tells her, and what does mummy say? Mummy says, tell him I'm not in. And so she goes back and says, I'm afraid mummy's not here and puts the phone down. So right from the word go, we teach children that however much they should not tell fibs uh, in normal circumstances, when it comes to a salesperson, it's perfectly acceptable. Yeah. And that rather kind of, uh, simple uh, um, example is is a way that we develop a kind of real mistrust of salespeople. And of course, the salespeople respond to this mistrust by getting even worse than they might have otherwise been. I was in a garage the other day getting, as you do, some new tyres for my daughter's car. And uh, this guy started saying, well, we've got some reconditioned tyres. Now, I, I just don't trust reconditioned tyres, there's no way in a million years. Uh, but he really did pummel me 
you know, it took about three or four minutes of quite firm resolve to persuade him I actually wanted new tyres. And this stuff goes on all the time. We hate that form of salesmanship. Yeah. And that's why, um, uh, having seen all of that, actually, unfortunately, we get into a sales environment ourselves. And believe it or not, we get a little bit like that ourselves. We get a little bit enthusiastic and we don't really listen and we interrupt. And the moment we've got a chance to talk about our product or service, we go on and on and all that kind of good stuff. And so um, changing that paradigm is quite difficult but there is a better way of doing this in a way which is much more natural yeah. and a way that recognises that uh, a sales conversation is just a conversation between two people uh, with a mutual interest. The mutual interest is simple, as you've alluded to already. It's either to decide that it just won't work between you, which is absolutely fine. Um, and that's what I encourage people to look for, the reason why you don't do business together. Yeah. And then in the absence of finding a reason why you wouldn't do business together, uh, working on the yes, which is what, how can we take it forward to discover how best we might work together. It's a conversation. Yeah. And if we can get all of that, yeah. that old wiring, that old thinking out of the way, which takes a lot of doing, mm. uh, then um, selling. I had a client the other day who said, thank you very much. I've just, I've just suddenly discovered, and he's well into his probably late, late 50s um so he's been at the game for a while and he said you know i've had an absolute epiphany here for the first time in the last two months i've started enjoying a sales conversation and that's what it should be like so for all those out there who actually dread the sales conversation find it difficult or awkward or just don't feel right or comfortable in it there is a better way. That's not me selling. There are loads of people like me. Just look up Sandler. It doesn't have to be me. There's, there's a lot of people around. Uh, go and have a chat to one of them. You know, just, just see what you think. And being a Sandler sales process, it won't be pushy. <laughs> you won't feel in any way <laughs> encouraged to do something you don't want to do. Quite the opposite, actually. Yeah. Uh, the chances are that if it works for you, you will want it to happen. So okay. there's a lot there. Well, well, this is what I found from um, from doing your training course. It, it kind of like flips the whole um, sales mentality on its head type of thing. It, and it kind of yeah. reverse engineers sort of like um, a lot of the things. I know that um, for myself, I sort of like walked away from um, your training course going, well, rather than taking sort of like a scattergun approach um to actually sort of like fine tune sort of like what is my ideal client avatar and where do they hang out and um how i might present what it is that i'm doing in a different way like for example um in my working life as you know sort of like i'm very much involved in um cyber security cyber security data protection information security um network security by extension and there are lots of companies out there that need these types of services. Um, but it realistically sort of like when I think back to how I was presenting that before I came on your course as to how I present it now, chalk and cheese, you know, mm. to totally different approach. Now it's the case of, well, look, you know, this is what I do. And if you need my help, I'm here. Um, I do a lot of work for um, IT companies. I'm kind of like the value add to an IT company who might actually manage your network. Um, yep. Yep. And actually sort of saying to these people, I'm not here to take your business away. I'm here to add value to what you already do. You know, and actually sort of like changing the context um, of the conversation ha has been extraordinarily helpful. And, and, you know, to be fair, sort of like, I did one of your free introductory courses. I haven't even gone into the meat of, of the, the real in-depth value that you have to offer, but just even having that, that sliver at the top ha has made quite an enormous difference. So, I mean, to people who are listening out here, um, I really highly recommend um, Rupert because I've been on Rupert's courses and Rupert has shared information with me and stuff like that. And, you know, I consider Rupert to be one of my friends. So I would definitely recommend Rupert because, again, it's not about who you know. It's, sorry, not about what you know. It's about who you know. And to me, Rupert is a trusted individual in this area. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're having issues with your sales and your sales funnel and you find that 
like so many of us in business, um, the sales funnel is full and then the sales funnel is empty. And then you're kind of like chasing yeah. again because it's empty and you have to fill it back up again. Um, I, I know from um, conversations that we've had that this is another area of um, the sales process that, um, that you're very well equipped to support and help businesses with. Well, look, um, there's, a, there's a, a rule. You talk about uh, it turning things on its head. And, and I'd like to give an, uh, an example of that because, and I'll relate it back to the sales funnel, okay? Although it's, uh, this principle uh, applies to all selling, in my view. The thing that gets in the way of selling is, is not technique. You can read a book or you can go and line and you can go to a seminar. There's a million and one ways to get technique. So this is how you do something. This is how you might ask for the sale. This is how you open a, a cold call or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and, and you don't have to go to me to do that. You don't even have to do Sandler. I, I think Sandler's pretty good, actually, but I think there are lots of other good systems out there for technique. The difference um, that I try and stress is the challenge for sales is, is not knowing. There's nothing so overrated as knowing, and there's nothing so underrated as doing. And the gap between knowing and doing is where most training falls down. Because we go to the seminar, we feel fired up and think, oh, that's brilliant. But actually, when it comes to sitting in front of our prospect, we revert back to the ways that we're used to, the comfortable ways. So there's a conceptual challenge with how you get uh, over that gap. Now, the reason, in my view, for what it's worth, the reason why that is such a challenge is we have a massive fear of failure. And of course, if somebody says to you, do you know what, instead of doing it that way, I'm going to encourage you to do it that way. In the seminar, you might go, okay, intellectually, I understand that. I can see the reason why that might work. But actually, when it comes to the actual doing, our fear of failure, our own ego, our own sense, our own kind of what's going to happen if gets in the way so we we wobble out of it. We wimp at the moment when we could actually make it happen. And so learning to fail to win is a fundamental underpinning. So let's, let's look at, uh, you mentioned sales pipeline, for example. Yeah. If I ask most people to look at their prospecting pipeline, so how many people of varying shades, varying from suspects, as you might call it, so people right at, you know, on the very fringes, kind of vaguely in the kind of, the territory nowhere near qualified in any sense right the way through down to to people that you're actually having a credible sales conversation with with a reasonable expectation of it it getting somewhere um a lot of people would say well i've got a i've got a lot of lot of prospects a lot of lot of stuff in my pipeline um but i would query how much of it is relevant because i think uh sales people we all we're all sales people uh suffer from a mixture of um hope and opium, which I call hopium, which is an addictive drug which feeds pipelines which are not properly qualified. So by way of example, I did one of my uh, courses uh, as a contract cleaning company. The guy said, uh, when I asked him how many people are in his pipeline, he said, I've got about 300. And that's not untypical. I don't know what yours is like, but it's not unusual to find the number of prospects that they're kind of in touch with in the pipeline, somewhere in, measured in the hundreds. And I said, what I'd like you to do, Anthony, is I want you to go back. And after this course is finished, I'd like you to go back and I'd like you to ask yourself the question, which is simply, which of these 300 do I have a clear next step agreed with them? In other words, which of those uh, 300, if I were to put on a piece of paper what I expect the next step to be, and they were to do it separately, we would say the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and of course, that that immediately edits out all the ones who, and we know who these are, oh, uh, why don't you give me a call in January? Or I'll tell you what, I've got to think about it and uh, I'll give you a call next Tuesday. These are all, you know, prospects way of basically saying no, nutting it into the long grass. Yeah. And if you're really honest with yourself, well, what he did is he uh, took 300 plus uh, prospects, he whittled it down to 25. 
Yeah. And the reason why I know that is I met him uh, recently, actually. It was one of the few face-to-face -face networking meetings I went to. It was just in that little period when we were allowed to meet 30, uh, up to 30 business people in a room. And it was, it must have been about mid-October, something like that. I think it's around October 10th, 11th, something like that. And I walked in, he came bounding up to me and said, Rupert, I was only talking about you the other day. It was very interesting, Anthony. I hope it wasn't all bad. He goes, um, yeah, I was talking to my MD. I said, why on earth were you talking to my M your MD about me? And he said, well, he asked me a question. And the question he asked me is, Anthony, over the last nine months, your performance is noticeably better not only that not only the kind of revenues significantly up but you seem to be much more in control than you ever used to be you seem to be have a much greater sense of purpose and bless him anthony said well i can only put that down to rupert because he told me about this kind of pipeline thing he took 300 down to 25 he concentrated on the 25 and his results just shot up yeah now that's counterintuitive that's difficult for people to do. Why? Because they don't want to lose the other 275 because the, the way our brains work, there might be something in there. Yeah. I don't want to get rid of those things. But yeah. what it does is it dissipates our efforts. It cons us into believing that we can be all right because something somewhere will, it's the hopium thing. Yeah. And that's why I say when it comes to sales, the biggest challenge is not the technique. It really isn't. You need to learn that. You need to practice it. You need to work at it and ideally do it every single day to a schedule with a coach. doesn't have to be me, but someone who holds you accountable to doing it well and get better and better each time. That's That I take as a given. There's anyone who's serious about sales. But actually, the real challenge is that kind of mental block that we get. And we're very clever at creating these mental blocks. Um, and without some paradigm, some attitudinal shift that you can take you'll always fall back into them you don't do cold calls because what's the latest cold call excuse oh yeah businesses are struggling they don't want calls from me <laughs> what you've got a product or service that will help them do better and they don't want to call from you yeah but we make these things up and they are real hurdles so um yeah it's uh, it's fun it, it's very good fun and uh, it's not for everyone no. It's not for everyone, Anna. It really isn't. And you, you obviously got a lot out of a very little, so I'm really delighted by yeah, that. Well, An I awful lot of people would turn up and not get anything. But, um, well, I mean, you know, enough people do. Yeah. Well, it, well it's like um, this gentleman that you're <coughs> giving the example of. I mean, uh, after I did that little bit of um, training with you, I came back and I looked at my prospect list. And there was you know, a few hundred people on there. And I've kind of gone, no, actually. So like, this is, this is not a technique issue. This is not a product issue. This is not a service issue. This is a mindset issue. And yep. like, like your, like your um, client, um, I, I did exactly the same thing. I've kind of gone like, no, actually. So like these people here, I'm just such a long way off from having any positive kind of resolution with them they can go on the B list and they can kind of like sit there, but I'm going to concentrate on my A list and my A list, um, I whittled it down to about 20 and I have had results. So like, very good. You know, obviously my, my services are slightly different. So I, I kind of, I have this annual cycle with people because obviously the stuff that I do is stuff that needs to be reviewed and reevaluated and, sometimes rewritten on an annual basis obviously with the covid there was lots that had to be rewritten because suddenly everybody was working from home so cyber policies had to be updated to take into account the fact that so many more people were working from home and were the right security mechanisms in place because they were working from home so i've actually had quite a busy time out of it so you know where some people have, have lost out so sort of like i consider myself quite blessed and quite fortunate that for me, this has actually been a very busy phase. But um, again, it's all about capacity as well, but it's, it's the mindset, you know? And I think as entrepreneurs, what I've learned over the years, that it's not about quantity, it's about the quality. You know, the quality of your customers, yeah. the quality of your prospects, um, the quality of the connections that you're making. It's like sometimes, you know, and again, if we go back to LinkedIn, so like there are people that um, 
possibly might in a hundred years from now need my service because it will suddenly become apparent to them that they should have done. Um, but they'll kind of like want to connect. It's kind of, um, and they're in kind of like really random and diverse fields that have kind of like really got nothing to do with the mainstream of what I'm doing. So because I'm polite, I'll connect with them and I'll have that discovery conversation, which does kind of like sometimes chew through 45 minutes or half an hour and sometimes a little bit longer of my life. And I do that out of politeness because I think, you know, if I want people to show me respect and politeness, then I should be showing it to other people, even if my gut feeling is, is that not really. Um, I, I think as human beings, we owe that to each, to each other. Um, but then I sort of like, from those discovery conversations, I then create the next bit of the A list. And then I have my B list, which kind of like sits there. They're interesting people that I know. I might be of service. They might be of service, but they're not present, if that makes sense. You, they're not active in your yeah. pipeline as such. Yeah, exactly. Right, yeah. Okay, now I understand that. Do you know what? When you uh, phone up, because clearly you're not going to, wipe 275 people out of your prospecting list without at least one attempt to qualify them in sure. some way are you exactly. uh, that would that really would be a waste i mean you could do it but there might be something in there and you know what um uh, most of them will not respond but a, a, a possible message if it helps goes something like this it goes um, Anna, we haven't spoken for a while now. Um, I'm guessing that things in your world have moved on, which is fine. Uh, so if it's OK with you, um, I'm going to close the file. Mm. Um, wishing you every success uh, in your business going forward. Yours sincerely, kind regards, blah, blah, blah. OK. Now, most people will read that if they read it at all and think, fine, I was never that interested anyway. They're the, they're the people who are going to waste your time eventually anyway. Yeah. But just occasionally, just occasionally, and maybe as little as one in 20, but if you've got 200-plus uh, prospects, that's 10. Yeah. One in 20 uh, would go, oh, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, no, I'm sorry I haven't been in touch. X, Y, and Z has been going on. No, we, we need to talk. Yeah. This stuff is not um it's not rocket science it's not like uh you have to change the you just have to be brave for about five minutes a day yeah. and write 275 emails for example saying that you're gonna close the file that is so against the behaviors of most salespeople; they won't do it yeah they won't do it. They don't. Uh, the one thing about my uh, the story I told about Anthony is he, he wasn't the boss. He's the sales manager, director, or whatever. But he was answerable to his boss. Now, so his boss had come long term and said, "How's it going? What's the sales pipeline like?" And he says, "Well, I've reduced it down from three hundred to twenty-five. That takes quite a lot of guts to tell your boss that, doesn't it?" And but he did it, and it worked. And so. Once again, you're back to that attitudinal thing that you're talking about. Yeah. So um, yeah. that's the challenge. Uh, and do you know what the problem with that? There's no silver bullet to it. No. There's no silver bullet because people people get it at an intellectual level. And even maybe some people listening to it say, well, oh, that'd be worth trying. But they get to the point where they think there's enough in it to do something about it. Uh, and then they do it. And then next time they kind of slightly wimp out. So... For example, a discussion about money. Uh, typically, in a sales conversation, money is the last thing that's mentioned in terms of the presentation or the pitch because I was always taught completely wrongly, uh, at great expense, by the way, trained to leave the money conversation to the end because I was told what I should do is make sure that the prospect really understood the product and service I was selling and had such a yearn for it, such an aching need for it, that the money thing would not be a problem. And that stuff, by the way, is still being trained now as I speak. It could not be more wrong.
Because all that happens is you end up doing a million dollar presentation, which you've invested a lot of time and energy in. And you get to the point where we say, right, this is how much it costs. And your prospect's chin just hits the deck and says, well, if I'd known that, we, we, we wouldn't have been having this conversation at all. What a waste of time and effort. Yeah. So w when's the good idea to talk to the money about the money thing? Beforehand, yeah. early. Get to the money question early. It's so obvious, and yet salespeople hesitate to do it. Well, again, it's like um, not so much now, obviously, because COVID has closed so many sort of like street markets down and things like that. But um, I, I like rummaging around in street markets. You find all sorts of like interesting, cute, handmade, homemade, whatever made um, things, uh, sometimes even sort of like bizarre little antiques, which sort of like I quite like. And, one, and the first question that you ask as a buyer when you're in a market stall is, how much is that? You're holding it in your hands. You clearly want it. You want to know, how much is it? And I think what you say um, from a business perspective of putting the money up front and so going, well, this service is going to cost you X amount, you know, whatever it might be. I, I think that to me, although it's counterintuitive, yes. yeah. it, it's a no-brainer. Yeah. We're in da I'm in danger of uh, conflating two issues. So there's the buyer system and then there's the seller system. Yeah. Now, of course, the buyer, like you, Anna, all they're interested in is money, aren't they? Yeah. Tell us the money. How many people come on to you and say, say, go on, how much does it cost? Now, my question to you, if you're the seller, are you going to answer them? Well, are you going to tell them? I'd, I'd have to say that in, in my personal experience, I definitely would answer them, you know, depending on, you know, what they've actually asked me, what they've actually asked me about. So like whether it's about writing a policy or or doing an audit. I mean, I do have sort of like ballpark figures for these things. And um, I'll quite openly sort of say that, you know, um, a, a, a policy that's written specific to your business, not from a template because templates have their place, but they one size fits all is rubbish as far as I'm concerned. And you would probably agree that in terms of selling, one size fits all is doesn't always work. There has to be some nuance to it. Um, and once the person has told me what it is specifically that they want, then I'll kind of go, well, it'll be between this and this. And I'm straight up front mm. about it because I don't want to waste their time and I don't want to waste my time and let my little imagination um, go into your hopium cycle because it's a, just a waste of time and I don't have time for that you know so that's kind of like one of that's personal to my approach I I know that there are other colleagues that maybe don't do it that way but um, I think that honesty and transparency is very very important if you're going to have the right sort of conversation with a with a prospect yeah, so when you're quoting, you've got a very, very clear understanding of exactly what they are telling you yeah. they want. Yeah. Hmm. If they're not sure, okay. then then sort of like, you know, kind of like I'm then, then I sort of say to them, well, if, if you can qualify what it is exactly, um, because again, so sort of like the other bit of it is, is that I don't just do the selling, I also do the delivery. So... I need to manage the expectation in terms of the delivery. So, uh, you know, like recently um, I, I picked up a very nice contract um, to produce the entire security suite for a, um, for a fintech startup company, which comprises of about 20 documents in two phases. And halfway through the process, they changed their infrastructure. So, um, you know, there, there was a qualifying to this. It's a case of, well, on the basis that your infrastructure is like this, it's going to take me this much time, and I'm going to need to speak to this person and this person and this person to make sure that the technicalities are right, and you can expect sort of like delivery in phases over this time stream at X amount. And they've gone, yeah, fine, because everything was qualified, and I didn't kind of, I wasn't wishy-washy in kind of going, oh, well, I don't know about this and I'm not sure about that. It's a case of, you know, when they came back to me and sort of said, um, really sorry, these first 10 documents that you're produced, you're going to have to rewrite some of them because we've changed our infrastructure. It was a case of, okay, then, fine, I'll do that. This is, this is how much that's going to cost. And they've gone, yeah, okay, then, fine. You know, because I think that these are very, very 
relevant um, conversations to be had because how can how can a company make a reasonable decision about what they're going to invest in and how they're going to invest or base their investment in different products and services if they don't know what the investment price is? Don't you think? Very, very true. So I, I think there's there's a number of things kind of slightly jumbling up up mm -hmm. here. Um, so if I could just try and kind of um, try and simplify it my own my own thoughts sure. okay um a lot of sales people worry about the money conversation because they have some kind of head trash they either think they're charged too much or they think the client's not going to pay it anyway or whatever so the way to address anything where you've got a problem it could be money it could be any part of uh the service i don't know if you anna to do what you need to do, you probably have to get access to some fairly senior people and get their time and their attention in order to understand best where they are so you can advise them on how best to proceed, stuff like that. Uh, that could be a, a bomb that could blow up the whole process if you don't get that access. Yeah. So when we have yeah. the conversation, let's move it away from the money bit, we have the conversation with our prospects right at the early stage. If there's some part of the process that typically causes a problem don't wait till you get to that bit in your sales uh, system uh, address it early so for me an example would be uh, and I have a number of ways of uh, protecting myself against this but an example for me would be someone who says that they want to be trained that appears to have uh, a lot of issues that could be addressed successfully through training but actually, I'm worried about their commitment uh, to actually get involved and getting stuck in and really, you know, getting over what are really quite difficult things because it's getting people out of their comfort zone. They've got to have some trust and uh, they've got to build that up and they've got to, you know, throw themselves into it. If I'm going to give 100%, it's not going to work if they're only doing 70% on every other Friday. Yeah. So that's, that's a big red line for me. Uh, in terms of working with people, because um, if if they don't throw themselves in, it's just not going to work. So, no no one's happy. Exactly. Um, so, so I I address that up front in the very early conversation. Say, look, there's a danger at the end of all of this. Probably not, but there's a slight possibility that we might decide it's a good idea to work together. If that were the case, could I just ask you? And then I put down the red line and I say. Look, depending on the outcome of this, your response, depending on the outcome of this conversation, uh, it'll either we'll either continue with the process of working out whether we can work together or not, or, or we'll call a halt to it at this stage. Yeah. So, uh, but that takes to an awful lot of salespeople, business owners, whoever they are, who um, are looking to grow their business, they've got a good prime prospect, looks good in their eyes, and they put a lot of effort and time and energy into getting that conversation. It takes a lot to put up the blocker early. Mm -hmm. But that goes back to the rule of you've got to learn to fail to win. Well, because once yeah. you do that and you have no fear of the potential downside, in other words, if they don't agree, there's nothing lost they just don't agree that they're going to do that. You're going to withdraw from the process and you're going to save yourselves a whole load of angst uh, and you're going to get on with something more positive. So there's, there really is no downside, but I promise you it's a challenge. And actually people listening to this will think, oh, I couldn't possibly do that. You yeah. can, and actually it's in your own and your prospects' own interests to do it. Well, I, I totally agree with that because, I mean, when I look at sort of like this um, magical mystery tour that's kind of brought me round full circle and now um, launching into um, this new venture. Um, the whole point of this was to kind of like pay it forward and talk about some of the failings. And, you know, you are quite right. So sort of like people are very, very, very afraid of um, failure because we, we live in a very success driven um, society. So sort of like, and it's not just business. It's also as individuals, how we, judge our success, how we measure our success. Um, everything is very, very success driven. So anything that's associated with failure throws up, I would imagine, sort of like flashing red beacons of, of fear, completely coursing through a person's mind and body. Um, but the truth of it is, is that um, I, I remember very, very clearly being um, 
being at being at school and being dyslexic and doing really really dreadfully quite often on the on the Friday sort of like um, spelling bee that we would have because Monday would be issued with the list of words that we had to learn not just how to spell but also how to use and then on the Friday we'd be tested on on those words and it's always the words that I got wrong that I now correctly remembered in my brain the words that I got right are the words that I got right and there was nothing learned from that because those words had been absorbed but it was the words that I got wrong that have stuck with me and and in the entrepreneurial journey I've had loads of failures and um, my American friends call that falling forwards you know um, and I think it's necessary I think it is absolutely 100% necessary for long-term success to be unafraid of failing and actually even admitting a failure. I mean, for a long time, I couldn't talk about the various failures that I've had in, in my entrepreneurial journey because I was embarrassed and I was ashamed. Um, but actually, it's, it's a very, very, very valuable part of the process. And... You know, the worst that somebody could say to you is, no, I'm not interested. And you think, phew, thank you. I've just saved a whole pile of time, money and effort in my own right. You know, so I, I think you're 100% correct. And I think, again, this all comes down to mindset, the way that we think about things. I think, um, I think there's a lot that needs to be done with regards to possibly adjusting our thought, our, our thought processes so that we can actually be more successful and more effective through cutting away the fear, making minor, making minor adjustments, uh, as you've um, suggested, which brings me um, to the topic of entrepreneurial self-care. Because even here, you've got a, a three-point strategy, which um, I try to apply. Um, I'm not always successful because of various... Um, competing pressures, but um, talk to me about your wonderful three-point entrepreneurial self-care plan. Well, look, um, there's a number of things. David Sandler was the guy who created the Sandler system, which is mm -hmm. probably pretty obvious. Yep. Uh, and he's no longer with us. He died in the 90s. But um, his story is quite interesting, and it's one of failure, actually, where he got chucked out of the family business because there was a shareholder takeover that kicked him out. Uh, he then set up as a salesman, struggled to do it, but worked really hard using traditional selling techniques and then uh, was successful to the extent that he was the top performing, in fact, the only performing salesperson in the business he was in, which was motivational speaking aids, you know, um, discs and things like that. Uh, and eventually the owner uh, sold the company to him and uh, he slogged away. Uh, but then he, I won't go into it now, I haven't got time, no one's that interested, but there, a certain thing happened to him. And he said, this, this is just the end of the line. And he took two years out and he sat down and tried to work out how selling could take place um, in, a, in the conversational way that I described earlier. And there's a lot that underpins it, a lot of psychology, a lot of kind of uh, pretty good uh, sound thinking to it. But he left us two genius attacks. One of them was, and it's so simple, uh, it's very easy to describe, which is the Sandler success triangle, which points to the fact that success in any one particular area does not mean overall that you'll succeed at what you're doing, particularly not in sales, need anything to be fair. Uh, but the success is a combination of both behaviours, so you've actually got to do the stuff, um, the right mindset, as we've been talking about, uh, the attitude and technique. So you've got behaviour, attitude and technique. And when you look at the attitude uh, triangle, there are three aspects of the attitude triangle. There's organisational, so how does the structure you work in you may be working for a company, it may be your company. How does that support your attitude? Do you struggle with the culture or not? 
Um, are there issues that uh, distract you and things like that? Or do you find the culture really supportive and really conducive to getting yourself in the right mindset? So that's one question. The second question is uh, about the climate you're in. So if you think of the environment you're in uh, competitively against what's going on in the wider business world, who knows, even the wider world currently, um, what, what are the kind of headwinds that you've got that can alter your attitude but top of the attitude triangle is the you bit mm. which is effectively your uh, mental uh, physical and spiritual dimension so it's another another triangle on top of the triangle and those issues are absolutely vital and and uh, without going into too much depth what i what i talk about is the separation of your roles which is all the things we do in life, everything from the work you do, but also the roles you play as father, son, daughter, aunt, whatever it happens to be, uh, you know, leader of the club scouts or whatever, you, whatever your roles are. And on the role side of the equation, you have good days and bad days. It's just the way it works. However hard you try, you have those days. And sometimes it goes well and sometimes it doesn't. On the I side of it, so separating out the roles from your essential identity, on the I side of it, these are the things that you're rooted in. These are the uh, philosophical ideas you've got. These are your morals. These are your principles. These are the things you hold true. These are your roots, effectively, that keep you secured, regardless of what's happening on the role side. So it doesn't matter if the world is falling apart on the role side. You still work at the I side. And the I side does include things like uh, giving yourself every opportunity to succeed. So, you know taking care of yourself, you know, spending time with loved ones. I know it's difficult now, but, you know, somehow connect, talk, I don't know, Zoom, do whatever it takes, um, keeping yourself uh, well. So making sure that you've got an understanding of how your diet is impacting your lifestyle, how you, how much you sleep, all, all that kind of thing. We, we know all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But exactly as I was saying on the sales side, that you've got to get out of your comfort zone and there's nothing so overrated as knowing and underrated as doing you go out and interview how would it what would it take to get fit and most people would say something along the lines i'd had to do more exercise or something like that or maybe they might go i'd have to hydrate or they might say get better sleep or i have to eat better well you know we kind of know how to do it right nothing so overrated as knowing but so underrated <laughs> And we don't do it. Yeah. And that's the challenge. That is the challenge. And therein lies a mass of literature. Yeah. I mean, there really is. I mean, I work with my clients to try and give some of the elements of the stuff that's worked for me personally and some of the stuff which I think represents the cutting edge thinking about how you overcome this, this stuff in here. Because yeah. that's where the challenge is. And, um, and it's difficult. Uh, so, and it's something that there is no solution, but there are approaches around behavior, attitude and technique that will gradually move you towards something which will support you in every aspect of your life, not just your business life, but your personal life. Every, well, every, every facet of your life will be helped. So it's important stuff, um, but as I keep saying, it is really difficult to do. And um, I guess the analogy is anyone can join a gym, but very few people turn up consistently. But the ones that tend to turn up consistently, the ones who are paying for a personal trainer, maybe there's just a, a little bit of, you know, if I'm going to pay this bloke or this girl 40 quid an hour or whatever it is, I better turn up and do something. Uh, whatever it takes work at it it's 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 a real challenge and uh yeah very very important and and never more so than now and i would admit i've really struggled over the last few weeks and i did catch covid19 which didn't help um and it didn't help either that i was away at the time because uh, we were allowed to go away at the time and um and the uh, testers took over a week to tell me i had it so I managed to infect an awful part of Wiltshire and um, Gloucestershire, which is where I was spending the time at the time, which is not great. Um, and there is a kind of long tail to some of these things, which I appear to be um, suffering from or benefiting from. I'm not sure which. Um, so you have to work at it uh, uh, ever more so in, the, in these times. But even if you're, if you're not testing positive for COVID, you know, 
working at that that um, that hallowed triangle of the kind of your spirit, your your mind, and and your physical, your body side of things, really important. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I think um, I think you've shared some really outstanding gems with us today, Rupert. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, for me, sort of like my mantra is. As I develop myself, all else follows. I, I do believe that the core of Absolutely. what we are, what we do, how we do it is very much based in our inner self. And then everything kind of like reflects outwardly. So I, I fully support um, the Sandler concept of kind of having, you know, of knowing and understanding your morals, your ethics, kind of like your, your commitment, um, your ability to commit. Because some people are just... Um, not trained in that way i mean when i when i was growing up sort of like work ethic and a commitment if you start something you have to finish it whether you know sort of like if you're going to do something you have to do it well or um what was meant yep. by that was doing it to the best of your ability so even if yep. i did rubbish at something if i knew that i'd given myself i'd given 100 percent of myself to that task and it still didn't work out I could still feel good about myself because I'd given it 100%. There was nothing more that I could have done to to that particular task. And um, I mean, I'm still suffering with my back and hip issues, which has really yep. much to my frustration, limited the amount of physical exercise that I can do, but I can walk. So I make a point of it's walking good. every day, getting out into the fresh yep. air, walking every day. I walk a couple of miles. It's not as much as I'd like to do. It's definitely not as much as I was doing before um, old age started to catch up with me. Um, but again, sort of like there are little bits and pieces and, and it's hard. It's the consistency. And I, I think that's, that's the other thing that I think we probably both agree. It is about the consistent day in, day out effort. And sometimes life gets in the way of things and you drop the ball and then you have to pick the ball up again next day. And some days it's a little bit harder than others, but we need to do it. Yep, very much so. Rupert, you've been an absolutely awesome guest. Um, I believe Thanks, that I had three questions for you. So what would you tell the younger version of yourself with all the knowledge and experience and the wonderful journey that you've had? What advice would you give to yourself? I'd uh, I'd probably say get out of your own way, and um, I think this is probably applies to all of us. But certainly, when you uh, are young and you think you're immortal and you're right and all of those good things, um, just get out of your own way. Uh, you, you you're not the most important person in the room, and if you are, you're in the wrong room. Uh, go go and mix with people who are better than you. Go and mix with people who are smarter, quicker, kinder, uh, and just work on the basis that every day you've just got to learn an awful lot. And um, and sometimes they're good days, sometimes bad days, but there's always another opportunity to learn. Perfect. Um, my second question is, what advice would you give to new and existing entrepreneurs? Or that should be new um, or existing entrepreneurs. Yeah, so... Uh, there's a concept um, in Sandler world, we call it guts. And uh, it, there's, a, there's a great book written by, I think it's Angela Duckworth, quite famous, so forgive me if I got the author wrong, um, called Grit. They're, they're one and the same thing to me. Um, but develop grit. And grit is a mixture of perseverance and passion. Um, and uh, it's sometimes misinterpreted. It's misinterpreted by entrepreneurs as ju just doing a lot of work. But no, grit is, is focused work. Get a goal, a, a long-term goal, one that moves you uh, consistently day in, day out towards an eventual aim. Hold to that goal, set your intermediary short-term goals to align to that, but have one goal. Work every day at all the necessaries, all the grunt work, all the basics, all the details. Just keep working away at it. Don't take no for an answer. Don't get depressed when it doesn't go wrong. Don't get too stir crazy when it goes right. Just stick at it. And those that do, it's the old, uh, you know, somebody stopped on the streets of Manhattan and they're asked, how do I get to the Carnegie Hall? And the answer is practice, practice. You know, it's, it's that kind of 10,000 hours plus 
to do the little things because it's in the little things that the great things come. It's in the little things practiced over years that people then become an overnight sensation. It's the, there's no such thing as an overnight sensation. There really isn't. It's a myth. So to all entrepreneurs, you know, any, anyone listening to this is thinking, oh God, it just seems to go on. That's what it's all about. That's, and actually, do you know what? When you tell the story of your life, the bit that you'll most revel in, that you'll kind of enjoy retrospectively, is the bit you're most struggling with now. Because in that moment, you show grit, you show courage. Mm. And sometimes we don't recognise it at the time. And I think um, I was going to ask you the third question, which was um, essentially sort of like, what's the most important thing those new entrepreneurs need to know about sales. And I think sort of like really we've covered it by answering this second question. It's, it really is about that commitment to dedicate that bit of time and, and show grit sort of like of, of knowing. Yes. You know. Yes. I, I look uh, specifically around sales. The biggest thing that stops us getting our sales uh, targets is us. We trip up all the time. Somebody says, tell us about your product and service, and we launch into telling them about products and services. It's completely the wrong thing to do because we've got no idea, no idea why they're asking. So we don't ask the question. We don't find out. We answer, the, we answer what we think is the question. We get it wrong. Yeah. We're too keen to present to us. We, we're too worried about being liked. You know, We're too worried about you know, getting a no, all that kind of in sales for entrepreneurs or anyone just once again as i said right at the start the advice to my younger self get out of your own way you are not imp- you are not important the only thing that's important is what your prospect has to fix if you understand that as the first step then you're on your way towards a sale if you just sit there just blathering on and throwing mud at the wall hoping some of it will stick good luck you're with everybody else by the way and sometimes the mud does stick but it's inefficient, tiring, and you've got other things to do as an entrepreneur than do all that kind of stuff. Absolutely brilliant. Rupert, I would like to thank you thank so you. much for your time. Pleasure, so Anna. much for your insights. Very good to see you. um, You've thank been an awesome guest. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I look forward to um, chatting with you again, both on and off, Absolutely. depending on how things go. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your insights. You've been absolutely outstanding. See you soon. And thank you for asking me, Anna, as well. No problem.